Well, what's up, everybody? It is Patrick Kirby, Do Good Better Consulting. It is Friday. It is happy hour. We are at a bar, and we were talking about all things awesome in fundraising. How are you? Hope you are doing fantastic. Welcome to all of you who are watching live. Welcome to all of you who are watching in the replay. I am ecstatic today because I get to bring along my friend Dave Senna. Dave, how are you today? I'm doing really good. I'm going to do this whole thing monotone no, to be well, the straight man. That's fair. <laughs> that is a good balance to our course. We are going to be talking about appeals today, and I couldn't be more excited to have Dave with us because he is an expert in all things sort of writing appeals and kind of the creatives, and really kind of walk us through uh, our calendar of giving and why we should be doing it. So first off, Dave, you should introduce yourself. Who are you? What do you do? What do you work for? And uh, give me all things bio starting now. <laughs> So I've got about 20 years fundraising sort of experience. I was an executive director for almost 13 years. And over the last four years, we've been uh, doing fundraising for lots of different nonprofits from a from New Life Center there in Fargo. We work with Price Station Partners Housing. And we do all things fundraising, appeal letters, website stuff, coaching. Our favorite thing, though, is commiserating over things that just are outside your control. And so we're doing all things fundraising for nonprofits. I like it. I like to refer to it as fundraising therapy. We, uh, nobody knows the misery like a fundraiser, like another fundraiser. So kudos to you for that. So let's just talk about appeals. Um, I, let's just start at the start. You, you write a lot of them. Um, you help publish them. You help kind of create and design them. What's the importance and why should uh, organizations of any size think about and want to uh, be involved with anything as it has to do with written appeals. Yeah, the written appeals are one of the things that I'm excited about with appeal letters in general is it's like the old thing that's become really new and cool. Um, with the advent of email and Facebook and social media, to actually get something in your mailbox from a favorite charity that has a a custom real story to be a small paragraph or a larger, longer letter, but that is actually something that is a little heart throbbing and shaking. There's just nothing better than an appeal letter. People read them, they save them. I had, I interviewed one donor. He says he saves them all year. At the end of the year, they pick which charities they are going to give to. You can't do that with Facebook or social media, having something tangible. It's amazing what donors will do to save those, read them again. It's just a great way to share your story. I remember working for a, uh, a previous uh, organization and they had a, uh, we got envelopes from appeals that were written 15 to 20 years prior to. Like they would just randomly show up with different addresses that would find their way because they just saved them. It's unbelievable. And, and that's really the interesting thing too. We have this really hot thing. It's social media. We're going to do all digital and I, there's a place for it. There's a wonderful place for digital media. There's a wonderful place for digital appeals. But there's something very interesting about a tangible, I can hold in my hand, something that is written for me and addressed to me uh, that I think is, uh, is, is, is sort of making a comeback, isn't it? Yeah, one of the things that I tell people, if you've ever watched, you'll like this. If, if you ever watched the movie Hitch, mm -hmm. where he's trying to teach the gentleman, I forget, uh, uh, how to kiss. And he says, lean in 90% and let the person come in 10. And that's what we do with an appeal letter. We're giving them all of our story, emotion, everything that we have, and then we allow them to, to then respond to what we do. And there's just something about appeal letters that the written form that's just very, very powerful when you can actually have it in your hand. And then if you get interrupted, it's still there. If you get interrupted in email, what do people do? They delete it. If they're reading Facebook and get interrupted, it goes to the bottom of the feed. But if you have it physically in your hand, it's a totally different thing. Now, you got to do it well. You have to have the person's name on it. You actually have to go and do some details with it. So that's a little bit different than some of the other uh, things you might do. And it does take some thought, um, but there's just no substitute for it. It helps lift everything else that you do in your organization. I like the fact that you're the first guest that I've had on all of these trainings that has used uh, the uh, – the theme of making out with somebody as a fundraising trait. So I appreciate that from you. Uh, I also really appreciate that you are talking about how much effort and work that this 
takes. This is not an easy thing to do. And there's very much, there's a lot of purpose mm -hmm. behind it. You need to have some detail. You need to do some research. Um, you have to put some thought into this. And I think that's what a lot of organizations get wrong. They want to do an appeal and they just want to rush out the, 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 the easiest and, and quickest thing to do it. Talk a little bit about what kind of detail and kind of dirt you need to just start digging in to start really producing some really high quality um, appeal letters uh, in all things. Yeah, so one of the things that we do um, at Bowl Leading is uh, what we like to do if, if we're uh, afforded it is to actually go and interview uh, actual clients or guests, people that have been affected by the ministry. And we sit down there with an exhaustive list of questions, trying to find out what is the transformation that goes from them coming to your organization, them, them leaving, or what that experience was like. And so we actually do the interview we transcribe it. We actually then take that and we find the story in there that makes sense. And then uh, we sit on it a little bit and then you actually craft it and you got to, there's kind of a story arc that you have to use. So it's somebody's trying to get something, there's a barrier to it. They get help from somebody. And if they don't make it, this is the problem they're going to face. Or if they do make it, this is what you've done for them. So there is a story arc that we like to find to, um, follow and then there are some other subtleties you have to worry about like you should not be the hero in the story is the the nonprofit. you're like the ups driver you're the one that is delivering a gift of compassion and encouragement to one of your clients you're not the main and anytime you say we you can help us then you're doing it wrong you should be saying because you give you are doing x y and because of that this is what's happening Everybody knows it's you. It's on your letterhead. You don't have to talk about yourself. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it's, uh, it's all about you, but it has nothing to do about you. So uh, yeah. get over that. You know, it's, it's interesting you talk about the story arc. And, and I think a lot of us in the nonprofit industry, especially in the fundraising world, probably have some sort of musical or theater background. And so we, we, we understand the, the, the how to tell a story. And right, right when, the, you know, that hero's journey uh, that we're we're all working towards as far as a program goes. So using those kind of um, uh, experiences in our background as we're sort of crafting out our messaging is, I think, is super important. And and really, you touched on the, the story arc too. There's really power in being consistent in your messaging through the entire year through your appeals, isn't it? I mean, there's you don't want to be just sort of sporadic all over the all over the place. There's there's some real power in knowing that you have consistency of excellence and, and trying to, to build this story from until you get to the end of the year where you're like, okay, now that you have all your checkbooks ready and you feel guilty about your Christmas presents, unveil it for us and, and, and give us from the end of the year, right? Yeah. So it's one of those things where every, um, I would assume every, every church in the land, every Sunday you get an offering. It's at the same time. They do it the same way. Not everybody participates every Sunday, uh, no argument whether they should or shouldn't, but not everybody does. In the same fashion as you're writing your appeal letters, you want what I say, what I tell our clients is you want to prime the pump. And so you're trying to tell touch points and stories um, throughout the whole year uh, with the idea that you may have them only respond to one or two mailings throughout the year, but you've set them at the year end when they're the most active and wanting to give that they're like, oh yeah, this is so-and-so, and the brand looks the same, the feel looks the same, they've heard the, a similar story, different cast of characters, and it just creates trust, consistency, there's a brand awareness, and all of that just says to the donor, these people know what they're talking about, they know how to do stuff, they're not confused, because the more you confuse the donor, the less money they're gonna give. So the more they can predict, I know how the story ends, they win. It's, Absolutely, they want to back the winners. So the more consistent you can be and less confusing, uh, you're going to get more dollars in. You know, part of that too is even if they don't give on mm -hmm. every appeal, you are consistently getting in front of them to tell another story. I mean, if you can't, you can't physically meet with every single donor that you absolutely have, right? You don't want to, as, as an executive director, as a fundraising professional, as much as you want to meet with every $10 or $20 donor, 
there's time, right? You've got the ability. So what in lieu of that, can you consistently build a talking point or a touch point on and appeals, even though they might not give to you every single time, they expect sort of this continued story about like, oh, they are continuing to do good things. It wasn't that one time. It was they are continuing to do good things. Yeah, so one of the big things when you touched on, I think that's really helpful to nonprofits, this idea of, of um, time. And so, the, so if you map out a whole calendar year, and what we do is we'll go in with a nonprofit and we'll interview three or four clients or guests or recipients and we'll transcribe all those, we'll write the stories on those, and then we'll slowly uh, act them in a way that we're saving the, the client time. And you can do the same thing as a nonprofit in the slower months at the beginning of the year is interview some clients and guests, get their photos, write the stories, and then and you can get everything ready except for the postage almost. Obviously, you want to read it and make sure it's timely, but you could actually do most of that work in the beginning of the year and then just slow release it. The challenge for us is we just don't know all the steps and we don't take the time, but you, it can be done in a very yeah. efficient manner. Uh, you know, that, that brings us to a really good point, which is the giving calendar, the appeal calendar. So maybe walk through kind of your idea of best practices as far as when to hit donors with either, and maybe this is, is, is a, as a side note, is communication outside of asking for money and asking for appeals too, because there is, there's much value in sending something like a gift, a, like a note of appreciation that doesn't make an ask, right? A, a non-ask can be almost as powerful as an ask in, mm -hmm. in sort of appeal giving. So maybe map out kind of best practices that you found over the years of the best places and times to really hit people up for an appeal uh, as far as you've seen? Yeah, so it's uh, interesting. I think um, you, there's a certain amount of ex experimentation that you should do to see what, but generally January, February, although with some of the bigger giving um, uh, events we have, February has kind of been interesting in our area, but generally January and February or less, you, you would uh, – not expect to have a higher uh, response rate. So one of, a couple of things you can do is not only vary the amount, how often or what you mail throughout the year, but to how many people. So maybe you don't do your whole file. You don't do 500 people. You just mail out to 200 people and you select those. So what we encourage people to do is just map out January through December, donors, medium, small donors, and then just decide who are you going to give or send out to is a real quick. There's a lot more science you could do, but if you're a one or two man shop, just make it simple. Um, but generally, I we found is do acquisition and some really good appeals around the Easter holiday uh, is a really big one. And then do um, when you start getting to October, setting it up for Thanksgiving and then year end. If you're going to do a very basic one, you'd want to hit that April. Mm -hmm. Then we we saw success at some of the nonprofits I work with of sending one out, sending something out uh, almost eight 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 times a year. Of the, each letter, so it's not just give me money, but you're making change. Perfect. And so tell me about the importance. So, so end of your letter, we're coming up in, we're, I mean, we're, we're at the beginning. If you're watching this live, it is November. Um, people are in panic mode mostly on, uh, Hey, should I do an end of your letter? Should I be doing some of these things? Walk me through the importance and, and what should you be setting up now from an end of year appeal? Yeah, so, and, and the setup is, hopefully, is that you've had a year calendar, so you're doing this throughout the year, so you have many stories, but even right now, some of the things that you could decide that you wanted to do is, if you don't have a lot of time, uh, and depending on the size of your file, you can do uh, almost an oversized postcard that has an envelope, you send it in another envelope, and, and it's really quick, and so it's not a full traditional letter. It's easier to produce, and you can just send a quick note saying with an image of somebody that's been helped 
and saying thank you so much and you would you could send that out in preparation of a an actual appeal letter for key donors or you could flip it you could do something now that's very driven by a low ask which is you know we need uh, backpacks for kids how many backpacks would you buy and then do a longer letter to key donors saying it's more than backpacks it's about change kids lives and this is what you'd like to do so a lot of it depends on your timing and your resources but um, you can do a lot of very creative things in the fall that uh, can be very effective and give you a lot of dollars but you do have to make sure it's personal you get the address right get the name right so there is some work to be done all right let's just say I'm a nonprofit and I'm listening to these two fools talk about a whole bunch of stuff and a whole bunch of letters and I don't have the budget for doing all of these appeals and all of these things. How do, you, how do we address that with smaller nonprofits who may not have these extreme budgets that these larger organizations are consistently hitting some of these stuff up? A, how do you approach that? And then B, how do you just say the time and effort into investing in this is super important because? How do you, how do you talk them off of a cliff, if you will? We're talking about therapy, right? So how do you walk them off a cliff for this stuff? <laughs> Yeah, so I would say that if you're a smaller nonprofit, one of the things that you'd want to do is, uh, especially in January, if you can, is find some people that have writing experience, maybe a graphic designer, that you can con them in with a little bit of beer to actually help you out and just develop a template that you generally use. If you can't do that, you if you have good letterhead, use letterhead with a response device that's separate and nimble. It can be very low budget. The most important thing, have good photos and have a great story, get their name right, have the address right. If you do some of those simple things and then on the envelope, even a handwritten note on the back of the envelope saying, you won't believe the change that, it, that is happening when you give. But to have a teaser on that envelope or an image that says, open me now, because it doesn't matter how expensive the package is, if you don't have a good envelope that's gonna get opened, um, it doesn't matter what you have inside. They're just going to toss it. So you want to make sure you, so you can do it low budget. But if you can do that, I would, I would do a lot of them in the very beginning of the year, set them up, get some help, and then you can give them out. Cause what ends up happening is you get, you get short on time and then you just get overwhelmed and then you just give up. Mm -hmm. So with the pre-planning, you can, we, you can do some low budget things with some, just some planning. Yeah, and, and, and I'm glad you mentioned that too, is that it's the importance of, even if you are out of time, or even if you are end of, don't give up everything, just do it. You know, the, the perfection, we've talked about this in every one of these, uh, in another one of these uh, video podcast stuff is, perfection gets in the way of progress, and if you aren't, if you don't have it all together, that's okay. You just got to churn it out, uh, especially at the end of the year where it's super important. So what if, what if people don't have um, addresses? They don't have a large list. Um, you know, you can walk me through the year. How are we collecting addresses? How are we collecting people who are interested in our story enough to actually receive a mailing? What, what are some of these um, techniques that you can um, help those uh, who may be smaller figure out how to gain a, a larger following so they have a larger mailing list so they can make maximum impact? Yeah, so one of the things that, it's a great question. A lot of it will depend on the type of organization you are. If you have an organization that has a footprint, like an actual facility somebody can tour, I would be down on the speaking circuit, getting people to come, and when they come, don't let them out of your place without getting a name, an address, an email, yes. and the contact information. If you go speak somewhere, have a yellow notepad, same thing, and get people to do that sort of thing. So there's lots of ways that you can do that. If you get really, really frustrated with staff or situation, it's midweek, it's about two o'clock, get out of, your, out of your office, get some basic materials, and then walk your neighborhood. Go to any business that's an open, bank, introduce yourself, develop relationships, and then um, get a business card, and then you could then send a note out to them, a personal note to where they finally are give, and then you can get them on your actual donor file. But you might have to do some really grassroots efforts. And we did that at Northlands uh, when I was at this other nonprofit. And we visited, and not everybody can do this, but we visited over 600 businesses in person each year for our event. So we actually went in, knocked on the door, and talked with people. 
And the more you do that, invite them back home, get their contact information. And, it, and again, just a yellow piece of paper that says name, address, phone number, email, and let them fill it in, mark it up, um, and then capture that. The other part of that is you do want to have a good way to house all that addresses. Uh, Excel's not always the best. There are other ways to do that. Um, that's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> but make sure your, hey, your data is consistent and clean. The worst thing you want to do is have some volunteer like accidentally delete your file after like years of stuff or corrupt it. Uh, so you do want to have some, some systems on the back end of how to manage and collect this data. Yes. Well, all the all you followers out there on the Do-Gooders Network can go to episode two and get Matt's uh, uh, stuff on documentation. It's a very good sell, Dave. I like that. So, and, and, and I really like what you said about this. This is a grind. This is not easy. And, and, and I want to make sure that you've got a support system with the rest of your, uh, your brotherhood and your sisterhood in the, in the nonprofit world. They're here, we're here to help as best as possible, but it does take work. And whether you are door knocking at 600 organizations or you're making phone calls to get confirmed information, every bit of, of, of work you put into knowing who you're sending it to and why you're sending them to them in the first place is completely valuable when it comes down to actually, you're, you know what you're asking for, you know who you're asking, and you have a better chance of getting a gift if you're putting in the work on the back end. I mean, that's just unbelievably a thing. All right, so we're kind of coming up to the tail end of this. But I'd have to, I would be remiss if I didn't ask some of the worst mistakes you have seen, the worst mistakes we've done. I've got a litany of them. Um, but like the things you've seen in other appeals, because we collect them, we're nerds, right? Um, the things that you've seen that just shouldn't be done. Like if you can get, eliminate these three or four things, you're going to be at least better than some of these other ones that come down the line. So what's the worst things you've seen, the things to avoid, uh, and the things to kind of um, to shake out before you start sending some stuff. Yeah, so I, I would say the first thing is you got to get the name right. Uh, the very first thing, you've got to make sure that if it's uh, John and Ann Johnson on the outside of the envelope, on the inside it says John and Ann. You shouldn't say John and Ann Johnson on the outside of the envelope, and then you open it up and it says, Dear John and Ann Johnson. You know, it should say, Dear Ann and John. Because they basically tell them that you don't know what you're doing, you don't care. And so you got to get their name and address right every time. That's, that's, mm -hmm. You've got to do that. The other part I would say is don't, don't make it confusing at all. Um, you got to make sure that your story is succinct. It, it tells a good story. It doesn't have to be complicated. Do not give like the nth degree of how you collect data and all this craziness. It's not a grant. You're trying to explain to your grandmother that's hard of hearing why she should give you some money. That's what we're trying to do. And so it should be compelling, quick and easy, and then have a very big response device so it's easy for them to give back to you. So have an envelope mm -hmm. send out these and they're like, oh, I don't want to send an envelope because people aren't going to give. You know how many envelopes we're going to waste? I'm sure they can go find an envelope and, uh, and, and get it to us. Well, you got to make it convenient too. So there will be some of the few ones, but uh, spell check it. That'd be good. <laughs> Grammarly.com. If you don't do anything else, Grammarly.com. You can get a little small subscription and they'll, they'll uh, correct all your stuff and help you out. So that's a, a really big one. The other thing I would do that I, I do a lot and it helps me and I encourage everybody to do it is to read the appeal letter out loud to yourself because you will hear so many things that you're, that you thought sounded great on paper, but you read it out loud and you're like, yeah, that sounds stupid. So <laughs> read it out loud. That'd be the, that'd be higher on the list. I, I absolutely love that. Uh, I think one of, I think one of my favorite appeals, I think I just sent you a, a screenshot of it a, a, prior to our conversation I, is the amount of words. And I know that the, the older generation uh, or the older generations, they like reading, it's totally fine, but you don't have to do war and peace. Because, I mean, that doesn't translate to anything, and it's terrible. So, also, maybe we can talk about this. So, you're writing an appeal. What should you be sending out in conjunction with that? We'll talk a little bit about, like, should you be sending a digital version of what you just sent out? And, and when should you send the digital version when you're sending the mailing version? Is there a, a science behind 
two days after you send and it drops, you should send an email. What does that look like? Yeah, so that's a good question. So we uh, normally put a package together. It'll have an appeal letter. There'll be some sort of response device they fill out. There'll be an envelope to return with them. We will also, for a client, work with them. Depending on their website, there may actually be a banner for their website, something for their Facebook, um, and also for email copy. It all is branded similar. We don't use the exact same copy. We use we try to change it a little bit for the channel. Um, and then you should, if you're going to do it digitally, there should be a landing page with uh, an appropriate ask that refers back. It shouldn't go to a generic d donation page. Now, if you're smaller and that's all you got, you do the best that you can and you work through that. Um, but as far as timing, this is kind of a Ford Chevrolet thing. And I would tell people test. Some people say sending the digital ahead of time helps them to see the envelope, which makes them open it. And, but then we have some people that say they hit the envelope, they have it, but then you hit them at Facebook and then they go online and give. So uh, I would say test it. Uh, we generally like to send the email a few days after we think it's going to be in, drop in their mailbox. So hopefully they'll see it and remember, pull it off the, the kitchen and then read it and hopefully give. I tend to agree with you on that point for sure. And the best part about writing an appeal letter and then sending it out email wise, you can pull pieces of that appeal to develop into your social media content that you don't have to start over from scratch. You've already got it there. And then you get to have a multimedia, multifaceted kind of thing. And it's brilliant. Okay. So we're coming up on the end. Dave, you have been a champion. You have been helping us all considered. Uh, this has pretty been fantastic. So people have some questions. They need some answers. How in the hell do they get a hold of you? And of course, as always, I will drop uh, your contact information in the comments when we repost for the replay. But how can they get a hold of you and um, go? Yep, uh, boldleading.com is the best way. I'm also out on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, you name it, we're out there. Um, but the best way, just shoot me an email, dave at boldleading.com. Uh, email works. We respond uh, quickly, and we'd love to answer questions. And we will be opening uh, up, uh, grand opening our new offices up in Grand Forks, North Dakota. And uh, if you want to know more about that, uh, like us on Facebook, and we'll be sending out information, and you can have some pizza. I don't know if we'll have beer, but we'll have uh, some uh, some finger foods and and uh, some fun. So um, hopefully we'll get that all going here in December. But check us out. Well, Facebook, if you invite all that kind of stuff, and we'll get back to people. Well, if you invite me to your open house, I will bring more beer. And speaking of this, I need another one of these, which means time is up for today's happy hour thing. Dave Senna, thank you so much for joining us today. And as always, we'll uh, we'll drop information in the comments. Let's keep the conversation going. We'll tag Dave in there too and force him to make some answers. Uh, people have some questions, and we'll uh, we'll connect the dots on there. Guys, thanks for uh, for joining us uh, live. Those of you who joined us here. And for those of you on the replay, thanks so much for watching. Dave, thanks for being here. Have yourself a fantastic rest of the day. See you guys.